Well, good morning. good morning. Nothing like two sarcastic videos before the message. Some of you are like, those were sarcastic? I was going to buy a Christian book. So, you know, it's interesting. Today we're ending our series, The Miracle of Mercy. Have you enjoyed this series this, this last few weeks? And we've had a lot of new folks come to church. And if you missed any of them, they're online. Make your stuff at home. Um, hang on, let me fix this. I messed up. My settings, does that ever happen to you? No. Never. I'll just, we'll just play Jeopardy music while we're waiting. Not that hey, it's better than it's a small world. All right, today we're talking about being an agent of mercy in the world. And there's two things I wanted to show by those videos. Number one is, if you want to reach people as a church... You have to continue to be unselfish, which means that you can't go in church and think this is my church, my seat, my door, my microphone, my, well, you know, this is your drum set, Bob, but, you know, this is my stuff and I've always done it this way. We've never done it that way before. And when, if we're not careful as church members, what happens is as we become part of a church, we begin to think we know how it should be. And we begin to think we know what should happen and what should. And if we're not careful, we think the church is here to serve us instead of it being a place to help us to reach people in the community and to help us to grow. That's why sometimes these messages, okay, sometimes every week, at some point in the message, it's going to be a little uncomfortable. Because what happens is we all struggle with selfishness and self-centeredness. Even if you've been a Christian for a long time, it's easy to slip into those old selfish habits. Then the second video is also true. I've talked to Christians who basically say that they feel like their job is to be separate. There's a verse that talks about being separate from the world, but it's not talking about interacting with people. Jesus made that very clear. And so today we're going to look at this idea... Of, um, of living in a mean world. So in a mean world, our greatest, our greatest witness is mercy. You are called to be a light. And I left my light in my bag that I was supposed to use as an illustration. So, so thanks. All right. So God can use you in a mean world. Did you know that? And there's Christians right now who are fretting that the world is getting dark. Can I, can I tell you something I heard years ago from Peter Lord? He said this. The world is getting dark, but we're in the light business. Amen. And so the, your job as a believer is to be light in a dark world, to show love where there is none, to show grace where there's hatred, to show mercy where there's judgment and unforgiveness. It's to show people how to find their way home. Now, I want to tell you something. One thing about our church that I love, so many people serve in our church. So many people are light in it. And I've had so many people tell me, thank you so much, see? And uh, so many... That was great. Good job. Um, now, this is awesome. And for those of you... Does anybody here run in the morning? You run in the morning? Both of you. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, uh, this is necessary. We've got a lady named Judy who runs in the morning. I think she started wearing a, a, a hazard uh, flash sign she took off of a thing. I mean, it's because people will run you over. We're called to be light. It doesn't take much light to dispel darkness. But we forget sometimes as believers. And so I want to point out something. And, and listen, you don't always get recognized at our church. We, we, rec we sometimes recognize a few people here and there. But there is no way to recognize everyone who serves here. But I just want to take a moment to do that on Celebration Sunday. If you serve here in any way, you help on a team, you help with Helping Hands Ministry, you hold a door open, you uh, are in any of our teams, serve in the kitchen, would you stand and just let us recognize you? Go ahead and stand where you're at. If you're not sure you're on a team, you probably are, okay? All right. You guys can sit down. Listen, you don't realize that every week before I ever get here, all this stuff is set up. 
Um, years ago, I used to come and help set up, and one of our, I think it might have been Mickey, it might have been Mickey, because he saw that on a Sunday morning, I was totally sweaty, and I went to hug somebody, and they went, ugh, and he said, you, you probably need to quit coming early. <laughs> We've got this. And so there's so many people who serve, and they serve unselfishly, and they go out of their way to live this out, to have that great witness of mercy, showing people that you don't get what you deserve. God withholds that and then he gives you grace. It's an awesome thing. So let's do two sections in this message today. Number one is we're going to talk about how can I be more merciful? Now, let me throw this out real quick. This applies to Facebook, people. <clears throat> By the way, I didn't do that because my throat needed it. This applies to Facebook. It applies when you're interacting with people. Be careful out there. Remember Hill Street Blues? Number one, look and listen for people's needs. Look and listen for people's needs. In Philippians 2, 4, it says this. Look out for one another's interests, not just for your own. It is easy to settle into our routines. It's easy to settle in the way we do things. Do you know most people aren't bad people? But why don't they help others if they're not? Because our number one enemy of doing and acting in mercy in your family, with your spouse, with your children, is we are too busy. Did you know some of you would change your life if you left five minutes earlier for places? Because if you left five minutes earlier for places, you wouldn't be so busy yelling at the people that are in front of you. Instead, you would be talking to the people that are next to you. And if there's nobody in the car, then maybe we would be spending time talking to God instead. We spend more time talking to the people in the cars who are trying to run us over than the others. So what do we need to do? This word for look that's in this verse is where we get the word for microscope or telescope. It's the idea of really focusing on. When's the last time you talked to somebody and you actually focused? You actually looked at them? Even when we're saying good morning, one of the tendencies, even when we're saying good morning at church, which we do, is, is we tend to look past each other. When's the last time you had to look? Now, I know there's people like me and Bob who you don't want to look at. I understand. Paul. You know, there are people that just looking at us is disturbing. Just squint a little. It'll help, okay? Listen to this. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus, do you know Jesus was busy? Jesus had a lot of people after him all the time. In a good way, not necessarily a bad way. Here's what it says. Mark 10, 21. Jesus, talking about somebody who came to him. Jesus looked at him. This isn't the only time it says it. He looked at him and he loved him. If you're going to love the people around you, one of the highest forms of love is to give them, you ready? You ready, ADD friends? Listen. Attention. We need to quit having attention deficit with each other. Some of your lives would be changed if you put down your devices for an hour. For an hour. I know. I know. How would you? And to actually look at each other. Look them in the eye. Actually listen to them. Parents, your kids don't need you to buy something else. They need you to spend time with them. They need you to look at them. Okay, so I'm going to make you all very uncomfortable this morning before we go any further. And you may need to squint if you sit next to Paul, okay? But I want you to take just a moment. I should give you a dollar every time I use you in a sermon. I will do that. All right, so take a moment and just look at the person next to you and say good morning. But look at them, okay? You ready? Go. I want to encourage you to do this in your workplace tomorrow. Now, don't be creepy, okay? We all know that person that keeps eye contact just a little too long. And don't get too close. We don't want your breath, all right? Get a mint. Some of you need a mint. I'm not going to give names out, but I will have a list later, right? And you've all had that person who comes to say hi to you and they get in your face and you try to breathe out when they breathe out and you try to breathe in when they breathe in because you just get... So, 
In America, we're arm's length people. Arm's length, all good. But you can still look at them. You still love them. Even people with bad breath. Number two, don't be offended by their sins. Oh my goodness, this would change the world today. You cannot look out at people and look down on them at the same time. I believe it was Mother Teresa that first said you can't love people and look down on them. So that means if somebody doesn't believe what you believe, you ready? It's okay. Did you know that people come to me, I talk to people all the time, and people, <laughs> this is funny because in restaurants people will say, this is my friend. And their friend will instantly look at them and go, I don't go to church, I hate pastors, and I'm an atheist. And I think they're expecting me to go, well, good looking hell. <laughs> right? Isn't that what they expect? Isn't that what they expect? So that's what I say. I every no. So I say it's nice to meet you. When somebody comes to me and they're struggling in their faith, or they're struggling with an ethical question, or they're struggling with a moral question, especially if they're not a Christian, I don't expect them to have the same values that I have. When the Bible says do not judge, it's not talking about the people in the church. There's actually, and you can look this up later, there's actually a verse that says judge those in the church. It's the idea of keeping each other accountable. But it says don't judge those outside of the church. And too often, we're so busy looking out and saying, I can't believe those people did that. Instead of looking at ourselves. Jude 1, 22 and 23. Show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. So when they come to you and they go, you know, I'm not sure I believe in creation. Don't look at them and go, oh, blah, 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 blah. I don't know what all that was, but I went to that church. They spoke in tongues. You should have seen it. It's unbe unbelievable. Rescue others. I love this. By snatching them from the flames of judgment. Some of us are pushing them in. Do you hear that? It says, snatch them from the frames and flames of judgment. We walk around going, oh, judgment. <laughs> there are still others to whom you need to show mercy. Listen, but be careful that you aren't contaminated by their sins. So this is the balance. It's the idea that you can accept somebody, but you don't have to approve of their lifestyle. Now, the world doesn't understand this either. Because they think, if you can't approve of my lifestyle, you hate me. That is not true. That is absolutely not true. My kids do stuff sometimes that I don't approve of. But I still accept them. I always accept them. And that's how Jesus was with us. Listen, when Jesus met the woman at the well, he could have come with a sign saying, God hates adulterers. Couldn't he? I don't know if Jesus walked that way, but it might have been a hot day. No, what did he do? He sat with her and he talked to her about water. And then he said to her, go and sin no more. It was the balance of having a relationship with someone. I have friends. I have a great friend. We were roommates in college. Has a totally different lifestyle. We've had conversation. And he said to me not too long ago, Eric, I wish every Christian was like you. And yet he knows I don't approve of his lifestyle. But he knows that I would hug him and accept him and care for him regardless of where he's at, regardless of what he's doing. That's love for people. Peter, 1 Peter 4, 8 says, More importantly, love each other deeply because love will cause people to hate each other and cause divisiveness. Oh, wait a second, sorry. I scratched it out in my Bible. Let me redo it. Love will cause people to forgive each other for many sins. So here's a principle for you Christians. You ready? Don't expect unbelievers to act like believers till they are. Too often we're, I can't believe people would act that way. They're not Christians. Don't expect to act any way they want to. It's, it's not our job. Paul, listen, Paul was dealing with Nero and what was going on. Romans. Roman towns were not places of Christianity. I mean, the Christian life spread in the middle of horrible things going on. And yet they were able to be a light and be able to love people in the middle of a dark world. This happened to Jesus, too. 
The Pharisees and Sadducees came up to Jesus and they said this in Matthew 9. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? By the way, the reason those are separated is they actually thought tax collectors were worse than regular sinners. You know, like prostitutes and adulterers and stuff. Those tax collectors were worse, which some of us would agree. Okay, but we have a tax collector in our church, so she loves when I read this verse. With tax collectors and sinners. And then Jesus said that when Jesus heard them, he said, It's not the healthy people who need a doctor, but the sick. So you can interact with the world. That doesn't mean you have to approve of what they do. So, for example, I had a good friend. He became a Christian, and he had struggled with alcohol. He used to go party with his friends. And he became a Christian, and he said, I'm going to go witness to my friends. I'm going to this party. He doesn't remember the end of the party. What happened? It was easy for him to fall into old ways. So you have to find that balance of loving people, but you don't have to pursue what they do. Ooh, that was the so rhyme. I like that. I'm a poet and don't know. Number three. I don't like this one, so I'm going to skip it. Because <laughs> I'm not good at this. Choose my words carefully. <laughs> when you talk, you should always be sarcastic Oh, wait. Be kind and pleasant so you'll be able to answer everyone in the way that you should. So when you get home, go through your Facebook status. Go through what you've said on other people's wall and, and put them across the Colossians 4, 6 test. Was it kind? Was it pleasant? Was I just trying to prove my point? So many people think that they're defending God when what they're really doing is just trying to be right. You are never persuasive when you are abrasive. And most of us have seen somebody get so mad that we've laughed at them. Have you ever done that? Where you're talking to somebody, all of a sudden they're so angry that you kind of look and you don't do it out loud because you don't want to get punched in the face. But you think, gosh, they look like a tomato and their eyes are about to pop out of their head, right? And you, you don't hear a thing they say, do you? You don't have to be mean, but the only way, some of you grew up and this is a habit in your life. You don't even realize that it's selfishness. You don't even re you're so used to it, it's just part of your life. And so you're saying, well, how do I break this? James 3.17 says, the wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, peace-loving, gentle, and at all times, and willing, listen, to yield to others. Wisdom is full of mercy. So you say, God, would you help me? To be full of mercy. Number four, value saving people over keeping rules. Matthew 23, how terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You are hypocrites. We love that word. It means to wear a mask. They were fake. They said one thing and they did another. You give God one tenth of everything you earn, even your mint, dill, and cumin, but you don't obey the really important teaching of the law, justice, mercy, and being loyal. These are the things you should do, listen, as well as the other things. We tend to value rules over people. Listen, it's okay to have boundaries. You need to have boundaries and not just let people walk all over you. But you need to not make rules more important than people. Now, I'm going to talk about money for just a second. So if you're visiting, cover your ears. All right? This is the passage that convinced me years ago. That tithing was biblical and that Jesus reaffirmed it. That you don't have to agree with me. That's okay. Tithing means to give 10% and it means first fruits. Even if you don't give 10%, I would encourage you to give first fruits. To say, God, you're first in my life. No matter what you do, I want you to know a couple things from me as your pastor, okay? I have no idea what anyone gives. So don't come up to me later and go, you did that sermon because you know I don't give. Which somebody did, by the way, one week. <laughs> And I went, I didn't know that. And they went, oh. A few weeks later, they came back and said, I'm giving now. I said, Good. But here's what I would encourage you to do. Make giving part of your budget. You see the work that God does here. You see what God, how he blesses people, all of you. You have no idea. And so many things go on behind the scenes where we help families. And so many things that we do. I want to encourage you. Listen, you give unto the Lord. And you pray about it. And you do what God tells you to do. 
But I would encourage you, make it part of your budget. Make it part of your life that it's just a natural thing that regardless of what's going on, you're going to give. And you sit, if you, you have a spouse, you sit and you talk to your spouse and you work it out. Don't do it because somebody manipulated you. Don't do it because you feel controlled. Do it out of just saying, God, I want to be faithful to you. This is the only time in Scripture that Jesus said to the Pharisees, hey, here's something you do good. But you've messed up all the other things. So even if you're faithful in every single way, but you don't love people, you've missed it. You've missed it. Make sure you care about people more than about the things that they do. I love when it gets really quiet when I say something about money. All right. Play. <laughs> it's just like, you're not going to talk about something I can do something about, right? All right. Places to be an agent of mercy. You ready? Here's some practical advice for you. Here's things to look for. Number one, look for people in crisis. That's not hard to do. In Galatians 6, 2, it says, carry each other for in others' burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of of Christ. So when you see somebody in crisis, they come to you and they say, I just found out I have cancer. I just found out I need surgery. I just found out that this happened in my life. Listen, don't go and Google their symptoms. Don't, don't go, you know, I looked that up on the internet. Here's what I Listen, listen to them. Look at them. Look them in the eyes and you can just say, I'm so sorry. I'm going to be praying for you. I'm here. If you need it, I'm here. Number two, look for people with unmet needs and help them. Each one of us needs to look after the good of people around us. By the way, if you want to fight selfishness, do this. Asking ourselves, how can I help? That's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't make it easy for himself by avoiding people's troubles, but he waded right in and helped out. As Thanksgiving is coming, if you look in the bulletin, we're going to help people have Thanksgiving. We're going to help people with Christmas. Every year, we help families with Christmas. That's something we can do as a church. But can I tell you something else? These people are all around you. There are people that need help. Now listen, the, the good thing is not always to give them money. There are some people in your life that no matter how much money you give them, they will run out of money. You know why? Because what they really need help with is budgeting. I used to have a guy, he was so great, and anytime somebody came for benevolence, after they came twice, I could say, hey, go and see so-and-so, and they'll help you with their budget, and if you have more trouble, we'll help you out. And they would go and meet with them, and we would talk to them about what's really important, what's not important. So let me just throw out a little advertisement for February. We're going to be doing the Dave Ramsey program in February. We're trying to figure out a good night for it. It's about 12 weeks. It will change your life. For some of you, it will change your children's lives. It will help you to discover some principles of finances. Because so many people, they don't need more money. They need to learn discipline. They need to realize that, you know what, I guess having $150 on the cable bill when it's not in my budget and I can't do it is not a good plan. Don't put your cable bill over your food. I mean, that, right? That sounds simple to some people, but other people are like, really? I've never thought of not. I have to have cable. Well, you kind of need to eat more, especially bacon. <laughs> Number three, grieving people. Comfort them. God is, and so how do you comfort them? You pray that God would help you. Listen, God is the Father who is full of mercy and all comfort. He comforts us every time we have trouble. So when others have trouble, we can comfort them with the same comfort God gives us. So think of words that are comforting. Don't go to people. Listen, and by the way, you don't have to say, I know how you feel. Because sometimes if somebody's struggling with something and you've never dealt with it, by the way, you know people that grieve? People grieve who've lost loved ones. People grieve, you ready for this, who are going through divorce. People grieve who are struggling with the loss of a friend that they thought was a great friend and that friend all of a sudden backstabbed them. They are grieving. They need comfort. They don't necessarily need advice. They need comfort. So how do you comfort them? You, you say to them, I am really sorry. Sometimes you have to say, I don't know how that feels. You don't have to give them a theology lesson. You know, in all things, God works for the good of those who loved him and were called according to his purpose. I just want you to know, I know that you're really sad right now, but God is going to work this for good. And that person is thinking, yeah, but I don't want to go through this. 
So instead of that comfort, hey, hug them. Give them a virtual hug. If they're on Facebook and they talk about one of their friends passing away or something, give them a hug. We all go through times of grieving. And can I tell you another thought for you? You need to think, what would Michelle do? And you're like, who's Michelle? Michelle in our church cooks food for everyone all the time. She would make you food, food every Sunday, all kind of food, right? If you can't do anything else, feed them. If you don't know how to feed them, give them a gift card. <laughs> go out of your way to say, I'm going to go out of my way. There's a reason they call it comfort food. Comfort people. Ask God to give you that. Number four, people needing friends. Show them hospitality. Hospitality is the idea of inviting them in your home. Romans 12 says it this way. Share with God's people who need help. Bring strangers in need into your homes. Now, please have boundaries. Please find the balance of this, okay? But most, a lot of us have never had anybody to our house. Dave Daniel, one of my mentors in my life who passed away years ago, used to tell me, Eric, you need to have coffee or breakfast with at least one Christian a week and talk to them about things that matter. So even if you don't want to have them at your house, go to Denny's. they got $4 deals. You can do that. You can handle it. If you can't handle it, have coffee. If you're a senior, have senior coffee. But it has to be a priority. It's easy to reject everybody who's not like you. Can I tell you a secret, though? Nobody's like you. It was interesting to go to seminary and work on my master's degree and then work on my doctorate degree. And as I got to know my professors more and more, you know what I discovered? When I first went, I thought, oh, I agree with this person. Oh, there you And then every once in a while, I'd go, what? You think, what? You're weird. What? Right? And I'm sure most of you, as you sit here on Sundays, every once in a while, go, what? Because when you get to know people, you don't have to agree with them 100%. We follow what Scripture says. We follow what the Bible says. But in disputable matters, we have grace and mercy with each other. In Matthew 25, Jesus talked about people who rejected him or accepted him. It said, I was alone and you welcomed me and showed me hospitality. Number five, look for people who need a second chance. How many of you in here sometime in your life, whether it was at a job or at home, were given a second chance? Anybody in here? I was given a second chance. I would have graduated from high school if my dean of the high school, I would not have walked in graduation if my dean of the high school didn't look at me and say, Eric, we're just going to pretend today never happened. We've all had those moments where we failed or when we've messed up. Second Corinthians, it says, when people sin, listen, you should forgive them and then do something else. Comfort them. So they won't give up in despair. When somebody blows it and they mess up, they can feel like a failure. They can feel like God doesn't love them. I had somebody last night tell me they've been a Christian for 30 years and never felt accepted by God. That's not God. That's somebody else in their life that told them they were never accepted and never loved. When you begin to read scripture and you understand that despite your sin and despite your failures and despite every time you mess up, God absolutely adores you. He doesn't just put up with you. He loved you so much. He sent Jesus, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners. While you were at your worst, he sent Christ to die for us. And then finally, number six. You probably don't have to look for these people. <laughs> they, they're just around you. Look for people who are rude. People who... Not just don't say the right things, they say the wrong things. You go with them somewhere and you go, oh no. Right? But here's your, here's your deal. Don't repay evil for evil. Never retaliate when people insult you or say unkind things on the internet about you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God wants you to do and he will bless you for it. Can I tell you something? I know that you can dance by yourself, but you can't fight by yourself. And when somebody wants to fight you, you do not have to be drawn in. <clears throat> Internet people, if you're watching online, listen. 
If you see something on Facebook that you don't like, can I give you a little tip? You don't have to respond. You can disagree with people and not even let them know it. Next time you're struggling with what to post on the internet, just imagine you're in an elevator with that person and they're nose to nose. Would you say, well, Paul might, but other people, would you say what you're about to type? It's very easy to be hateful from a distance. If somebody doesn't act the way you want them to act, but when you really invite them in your home, when you love them, even if they're rude, you start to say, you know, I know they're that way, but I still care about them. By the way, people say that to me all the time. Eric, I know how you are. We still love you, but... They almost get a twitch. Like, I have to. God can use you in a mean world to be a light. I know it's tiring sometimes. I know sometimes you feel like you're all alone, but the Bible said, Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And here's what I want you to know. No one will ever, may ever recognize you. You're in the light business, and you may never be recognized for being in the light business, but you just be faithful to do what God wants you to do. In Hebrews 6, it says this. God is fair. He won't forget the work you did. And the love you showed him by helping his people. This is a per perfect message for Celebration Sunday because that's what we celebrate. All the people who serve others and bring them home to Christ. And he will remember that you are still helping them. The good news is God forgets your sins. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'll be here after the service and you can say, Eric, I'm ready to give my life to Christ. I know about him. I understand him, but I've never surrendered the things that I do and who I am. I've never surrendered that to him. Today, I want to do that. The Bible says when you do that, he forgets your sins. But if you've been a believer for years and sometimes you feel like, you know, nobody ever notices and I just kind of do this and kind of getting tired and. God notices. If you never get an award, if nobody ever says thank you, if people even spitefully say things about you, even when you do what's right, guess what? God still notices. And so when that happens, you be faithful to what God wants you to do, not how people respond. You're not serving them. You're serving Him. Can we be lights of mercy in a darkening world? Yes. And I pray that our church more and more would be that, that people would come to church and go, I found my way home to Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, I thank you for your mercy and your grace on this pastor. Father, Lord, you know my brokenness and my failures, and you said that you don't think about those. But Father, you do know all the service, and you know that for each and every one here. All the things they do that no one may ever recognize, that some people may actually attack them about when they don't do things the way they want them to. And so, Father, I pray in the middle of that we would not be overcome by evil, as the Scripture says, but we would overcome evil with good. I pray that we would be a light here in Port St. John and around the world. Father, bless each family represented. I pray that we could speak words of kindness and love to each other. That we would lift children up who are hurting. People in our neighborhoods, Father, fill our homes with your light. Father, I pray especially if anyone in here doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We have our time of giving now. When you give, it makes a difference in the world. You give what God's...